right. Good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the uh, Force versus Power Masterclass tonight. And let me get the slideshow started up for you. Once that moves out of the way. So how many people are here tonight? Because you go and you do something. You're serving, helping people. You're doing the best you can as a father, as a husband. But you always feel empty. There's that voice. You know, a lot of us call it our demon, kind of barking in the background, demeaning us, pulling us down and just kind of beating on us. What would happen to your life? How would it change if that wasn't like that? If your voice, the voices in your head actually helped push you along or pull you to that next level instead of you sitting there using that force and trying to beat down that wall with a ball peen hammer instead of having access to all the power that's really inside you and knocking down that wall with a wrecking ball. That's the difference that we're talking about here tonight. This force versus power is all about the duality within us and it's really exemplified with the shadow side because that is the darkness we've been told our whole lives to be scared of the dark the boogeyman's gonna get you so and so's out there you know don't walk alone on a dark street all these fears mm -hmm. that get implanted into our mind without us even being consciously aware of it. And you hear people talk about, I mean, literally all the time, if you go on TikTok, it's on there all the time about people and their demons. Why do you keep getting up? Why do you keep going back for more? Well, if you're a man, you have to pick yourself back up. And, and I don't care who doesn't like that statement, but it's the truth. If you're going to walk tall and proud and make a difference in the world for your family, for yourself, and leave a legacy and a mark, how can you lay down and not get yourself back up and get going? And trust me when I say that I know how brutal that voice can be. As a person... <clears throat> that for probably 35, 40 years dealt with that voice in my head, always trying to tell me, hey, why don't you just quit? Why don't you just end it? You don't ever do anything right. I was so self-deprecating with my own internal dialogue that I never saw all the good that I was doing. Everything that I touched seemed to fall apart because I was forcing my way through it all. And now that I've learned how to get onto the other side of that, I'm here to help people get there faster. Because the only way that you can move forward the fastest way you can is with all of your being moving in that direction. It takes your entirety moving forward to get you where you want to go. You can't have half of your side back there pulling you back and half of your side out there in front that's so far out with your dreams that you can't see what's going on. You're stuck in the present and you have no idea what to go. And I know this is where a lot of people are because we're scared to death of that demon behind us. And we're so stuck in that fear that we can't enjoy the joy that's in this present moment. In fact, you can't get to that high of that joy, the peaks of that ecstatic joy that is rare, unless you deal with all the anger and rage that's inside you. 
it's all relative. It's on a scale. It's on the wave. You know, the anger and rage is down the bottom. The happiness and joy is at the top. And that's how this works. You have to be present with both pieces, the light and the dark, the true yin and yang experience, so that you can be neutral and move forward effectively. So a quick overview of what we're going to talk about this evening. When you stand in the light, when it's shining on you the brightest, you're casting a shadow. A lot of us grew up watching Peter Pan try to sew his shadow back on. And Disney did a great job of really kind of showing us that you have to have that part with you. There's always the villain to the hero. And normally they're both inside us at the same time. And this shadow that we're talking about, it's, it's a psychological term that Carl Jung put together or used when he was talking about this and understanding psychology back in the early 1900s. As he was stepping away from his mentor, Sigmund Freud, he was digging into himself so that he could figure out exactly what it was that was driving him. And many of us go to great lengths. Good Lord, do we go to great lengths to protect our self-image. I mean, how many people lie on social media and just show the good parts of your life so that nobody sees the unflattering stuff, the unfamiliar stuff where you're falling on your face because we don't want to be laughed at. The shadow side is tied to your ego. And when your ego gets bruised, it's easy to get down on yourself because it can get very, very loud. So in just a minute, we're going to jump into these three pieces here. What is a shadow? How is a shadow born? And ignore it at your own peril. And then we'll talk about what happens when you repress that shadow. And then I'll introduce you to the guest we have tonight, Dr. Bob Norman. So what is the shadow? The shadow is that dark side of your personality. You know, if you use the Batman and Joker as your reference here, this kind of gives us a good view of this, of the dichotomy that really exists, the duality of this. The shadow is primitive. It feeds off of negative human emotions, rage, anger, fear. The hurt and the wounds inside us when we got told that we're not good enough to go after our dreams. And it loves to feed on envy, greed, shame, our selfish desires, and that need and the desire to strive to be powerful. We've all been told that it's wrong to go for those things, to be that, especially right now in our society as men, this is very, very apparent for us. The toxic masculinity BS that's going on out there telling us that we're not supposed to be dangerous men, that we're not supposed to be strong, physical beings that exude confidence to the people around us. And that's where the shadow lurks the most. When we deny ourselves that ultra positive image, we perceive ourselves as inferior, unacceptable, evil, if you will, because of that shadow influence on us. And it can make a big dent in how big you perceive yourself. Anything that's incompatible with our chosen conscious attitude about ourselves relegates us to the dark side. When you're looking in the mirror and you're nitpicking at yourself for having a blemish, for having some marks on your face or a big scar, you're feeding that dark side. And that dark side slowly erodes 
everything underneath of us when we try to fight it. The personal shadow is also your disowned self. So with this, what we're talking about is if you look at the picture here, that little girl simulating Red Robin Hood. Yeah, Red Riding Hood <laughs> is the fear that we have. I'm not big enough to stand up to the wolf. I'm scared. And we don't claim our own power in our present. And this includes all our positive qualities, <clears throat> our courage, our bravery, our strengths, the good that we bring in and influence the world with. When we don't claim those, we're letting ourselves change what's really in front of us. And it goes from being an accurate perception to being one that's skewed by the shadow. It's got the darkness around it, the fuzziness. You can't see it clearly. And you struggle, just like looking down that picture, to see the forest for the trees because it's all clouded in the mist. And as these personality pieces, these, these small pieces that are small and feel that they can't go out and do what they need to, it casts them down even further. And we hit a threshold point psychologically and the shadow's born. And we can't get rid of it until we go back and sit with it. And that's kind of a big piece because when that's there and the noise is there, we more than likely just say, hey, shut up. We try to tune it out. We go and distract ourselves with Netflix, with porn, with beer, with drugs. Anything to get our mind off of the pain and the discomfort we're feeling. We want that quick endorphin hit so that we can numb everything else that we're dealing with. But no matter how hard you try, you can't eliminate it. The shadow will be with you for as long as you walk in the light. It has to be. And the bigger you get, the more you expand your life, the bigger your shadow is going to be. Just how it is. We have a great big oak tree and the sun shining down on it from like 10 o'clock in the morning. You got a long shadow. But when you have a little oak tree that's just starting, that's only a couple feet tall, there's not much of a shadow. That's what we're talking about with this light and part of the way the world works. So the shadow is born pretty much as soon as we start to develop our psychology as kids. Kids are wonderful. They have no boundaries. They love unconditionally. They exude kindness and happiness and generosity. And at the same time, at the flip of a hat, they can be throwing a temper tantrum and be extremely angry and selfish and greedy because they perceive that they got hurt. And these emotions are uniform across humanity. As a, we grow, we learn how to handle these. And that's why so often a shadow is tied to a child, to your inner child that you haven't handled the emotions with properly. Those thresholds were broken and the parts got created within your unconscious mind. The traits of being good so that you're accepted by others and, oh, you got mad, you're a bad kid and getting rejected and not getting love also feeds right into this. It goes back to like the basic human needs, safety, security, recognition, love, shelter, food. These exist regardless of where we live on the planet. These are basic things we have to have in our lives. And the shadow feeds on not having enough. 
And as children, we express certain parts of ourselves. You know, we were trained by our parents, by our people in our environment, by our school system, what was acceptable and what was not. So all those pieces that we shoved down, those repressed sexual feelings as we grew through adolescence, the thoughts of, well, that's not a good thought. No, it's just a thought. It's not good or bad. But all that feeds into creating this part of us that exists in our mind. You know, the anger, the outburst, all those unpleasant experiences that we had feed this. When a teacher shames us, when we acted boldly and spontaneously, good for God forbid you, you got in a fight or something at school anymore. <laughs> you know, you, you're put in a category of being a bad kid. If you don't study hard, you're bad. That's what drives this part of us, and it feeds on that negative emotion. So you wouldn't think. And a lot of times as parents, you know, I, I, me especially, I, I have no doubt here that the disapproval from our parents to our kids, hey, don't touch the stove, you're going to get burnt. That it creates this part, that this disapproval by the teachers when they're not doing their homework right, the ridicule and picking on by classmates, adjusts our behavior this much, that we learn at such a young age to adapt to what the external world wants, literally putting on a mask and hiding behind it so that we don't get reprimanded. And this goes on for the first 20 plus years of our lives, creating <clears throat> shadow, feeding it, because it's all bundled together and swept out of our view into our unconscious, where we do our best not to focus on it. And like Robert Bly says in the book, a little book on human shadow, the child puts all these unwanted parts into that invisible bag and drags it behind. Them. Do you ever wonder why your shoulders and your neck hurt every day? You're carrying that weight every day, all day long, and have been for years. That repression creates these unwanted parts. That is your shadow. And again, you know, Carl Jung said it, you know, there is no light without the shadow. There is no psychic wholeness without the imperfections. So what happens when we ignore this? And I'm sure you got can be a lot of people recognizing this. You know, we have our psyche, and this has been around for, for us for a long, long time. These parts were worshipped as we set the psyche aside as autonomous gods and goddesses. We created likenesses for them. And think about what happens when the Greeks didn't worship a god or a goddess anymore, when they ignored them. They usually got struck down and some catastrophe happened. If you like Odysseus's story. Where he went and sacked Troy and then got blown off course and took him 20 years to get home. The Odyssey. This is what they started building this out of. And any part of us that we disown that we want to try to fight and not just deal with. Gets represented into this shadow. And the shadow can operate on its own without our full awareness. It lurks in the shadow. Have you ever seen, like been at the dog park and there's that one dog that's out there that's kind of slinking along the fence? You know, he doesn't want to be out there and be with everybody else. Everybody's aware of it, you know, kind of unconsciously because you catch the movement. But our conscious 
mind is on autopilot so long and so much of the day that we're just kind of blindly going through. So this is always running in the background. That internal chatter we have in our heads is always there. And for those that have been in athletics, you know exactly what I'm talking about because we always talk to ourselves. If we make a mistake, we beat ourselves up over it. And we say things to ourselves that we would not ever dream of saying to somebody else. Even our worst enemy, we wouldn't talk that mean to. That's the stuff we're talking about. The shadow impacts every area of your life because it pulls so much of your energy dealing with this. And it's running in the background. It's kind of like leaving the lights on in your car. And you go out to start it the next day and the battery's dead. This is how the shadow impacts your world. Because when you're not fully charged up, you don't have the energy you need to deal with your spouse, your partner, your friends, your family, your job. This is why we run around feeling like we're running on empty all the time. How many times have you gone to sleep and not woken up and felt refreshed? And take it even further, we've all heard the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This was the true duality. And Dr. Jekyll wanted to find out how much of the dark side was really there with him. So he let it come out, very much like the Joker did in The Dark Knight. They let the darkness come out in them. They had no guilt. They had no shame because they were so broken that the dark side overtook them. That's what leads to depression, massive depression at that, because we repress the anger and the rage within us. We don't deal with our own stuff. And that holds us back. And what we're talking about here are the qualities that we kind of deny ourselves. When you have a sexual thought, it doesn't mean you have to beat yourself up over. It. You see a beautiful woman walking down the street, it's perfectly acceptable to admire it. You don't have to sit there and lust over it and stare at it, drooling with your tongue hanging out, you know, the old cartoon version type stuff, whistling like a dog and acting like a complete hooligan. You have the thought, okay, hey, I acknowledge the thought and move on. But when we fight it, that's when we create the anger at ourselves. That's when we give it power. The rudeness that we treat that side of us with bothers us, bothers that part. And we end up taking it out on ourselves. And it doesn't even happen consciously. We aren't even aware of how we're projecting this on ourselves and inflicting the pain on our ego and that shadow. So the mass just gets heavier and heavier, <clears throat> and it keeps distorting the reality that we live in. So that's what's going on with the shadow. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bob Norman, and he's going to share a little bit about his experience working with his own shadow. I thought it'd be good to give you guys just a different hint to let you know that you're not alone with this. We all deal with this on some level. Dr. Bob is a veteran of the U.S. Army. He retired from a highly decorated 20-plus year career in law enforcement. After retiring, he went back to school to earn his doctorate and began a quest to combine his love of helping people with his passion for natural wellness and fitness. With his doctorate, he offers many wellness solutions tailored to men specifically to address the wide range of health challenges, including a complete online supplementary dispensary with protocol specific to his client and patient base. Additionally, because of its popularity and its effectiveness, his main focus with his wellness practice has become his CBD line, and it's truly changing lives for all the patients 
and clients. He adores his kids, his grandsons, and his girlfriend, and their five dogs. He is passionate about his country, strength training, martial arts, college wrestling. He loves playing golf, is an avid golfer, loves skydiving, mountain biking, and hiking, and driving his Jeep. And he's a sought-after speaker. He's held many titles throughout his life, including captain, sensei, and doctor. His favorite titles are dad, pat, Bob, and friend. And now we're going to let Dr. Bob take it over. Thank Hi, you. Richard. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. I thank you. Said it better. <laughs> Appreciate it. It's a pleasure to have us here. Have you here with us tonight? It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, everyone, first of all, for uh, joining in with this. And thank you, Richard, for inviting me to come on tonight. Uh, it's an honor for me. Um, I sat here for that introduction, just shaking my head. Just, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and, and something came to mind. You mentioned a mask, and there's a great, my favorite Billy Joel song is called The Stranger. That we all wear a mask, and we don't always let everyone see us without that mask on. Uh, that, that's one of the great analogies for me. So uh, I'm not going to be super long, but this is something I'm really passionate about. So I did make some notes, and those are for your benefit, so I don't talk for an hour. <laughs> and Richard had asked me some specific questions to address as well. Uh, I will say that everything you said was right on target. That shadow is something that you have to deal with. If you don't deal with it, that's when it causes you a problem. When you deal with it, when you accept it, understand it, that's when you can deal with it. So first thing I'm going to do, or I would like to do, is, is respond to some of the questions that Richard had asked me to address. Um, he had asked me, asked me, excuse me, about the uh, the toll that the shadow, um, my career in law enforcement uh, after the Army was, uh, I retired as the commander of a supermax prison. Uh, when I was a lieutenant, I ran death row. Needless to say, I worked in an environment that was very dark violent and negative and i used to say that i worked very 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 hard to not let that negativity get me but it's kind of like jumping in a swimming pool you're going to get wet you're going to get that negativity on you the question is how do you deal with it what do you do with it while you're in it and more importantly what do you do after you're done with it how do you respond to it so some of the things that richard had asked me to talk about we wanted me to talk about the emotional toll uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, the toll that it takes on you when you're dealing with something like that. And so what I've made is a few notes of some of the things that it cost me dealing with that. Because you have to understand that growing up, I was a wrestler, uh, which I think helped me a lot because that being an independent sport, you know, it, it's, it's very demanding. Uh, you can't blame the quarterback. You can't blame the center. You can't blame the third baseman. You're out there. It's you. It's you either win or lose. Um, but I was a, I was a fairly shy kid in school, kind of popular, but shy. Like I, I always avoided trouble. Like I hate conflict and and I still do to this day, which makes people laugh because of what I did. And um, But I hate conflict. I always tried to avoid it. I was very shy. Um, and then I went into the army, uh, went into law enforcement, just a little bit of background on some of that stuff. Growing up, my dad, who was a great dad, I mean, I loved him dearly, but my dad used guilt as a tool to keep me in line. My dad did things that made you feel like there was something wrong with you. So anytime you made a mistake, he was just completely, completely disgusted. Anytime anything happened, even if it was out of your control, completely, something's wrong with you. So I went from that to a marriage with an alcoholic cheater. Uh, and I spent a lot of years, to be totally honest, you, honest with you, asking myself, what's wrong with me? Why would these people treat me this way? What, what's wrong with me? What, like, I can't seem to do anything right. One of the things that happens from that is it leads you to perfectionism. Because you don't ever want to get that wrath of that oh gee i can't believe he did that or you don't want to get in a fight with the, with the wife or whatever it is so a lot of 
really, really take a toll on you. Like Richard mentioned, growing up, how a lot of those things affect you. We carry a lot of baggage from when we were kids. Um, and I've gave I've given Richard a book before title that I was reading about how to change your perception of all that. But that's a whole other story. So some of the emotional tolls that being in that environment took on me personally was first of all lost time a lot of lost time with loved ones or lost quality time um lost relationships after i divorced i went through one girlfriend after another i just it's i just i was a terrible boyfriend um self-doubt is another emotional toll self-loathing they kind of go together uh, lack of identity is another one. Trying to figure out who you are. And that one came into play really big after I retired and tried to rediscover myself. Um, I was angry a lot. Um, I participated in some risky behaviors. Um, I looked, I found myself at different times, and I've seen this big time in a lot of people, but I even found myself looking for happiness outside myself through activities or possessions or girls or whatever it might be. Um, I used women in that case. I missed a lot of opportunities as a result of that. Regret is another big one because they say that you won't regret the things you did, but the things you don't do. And there are a lot of things that I wish I had done as a result of that. I kind of lost part of myself for a while had a little bit of an exaggerated temper. Um, I mentioned being a shy kid and, and, you know, being very, you know, not pretty, pretty chill. I, I used to tell my officers, I'm one of the easiest going people you ever meet, but if you put me in a corner, I'll cut your throat. And then I'll be okay again because I handled the problem. And it's of course metaphor. I'm not going to really cut anybody's throat. <clears throat> um, the other thing that it did, and this one, this one, really, when I was thinking about these things is it, it caused some some a little bit of a strained relationship with both my parents um, at different times. I was fortunate that I got to fix things with my mom, but I never got that opportunity with my dad. And that's a regret that I have. That goes right back to some of that regret. Um, and, and the last thing that I'll say about that particular topic is that there were times when I looked in the mirror and I didn't like what, who I saw staring back at me. Uh, that was a big motivator for a lot of change. Uh, he also asked me about struggling with my identity as I moved back into civilian life and separated from my job and, and you know, trying to find myself in that type of thing. And I spent several years trying to de-stress from that environment. And again, I worked very hard not to let it get to me. I practiced martial arts for years. I was in the dojo three hours a night, a couple nights a week. I was in the weight room every day when I got off duty for an hour, I got into lifting heavy. Um, so I did things, physical things to de-stress, but it still worked on you up here. Um, I was Captain Norman. That was my identity, it's who I was. And I, I needed to figure out who I would be after I retired without that clout and that authority. Like, what, what did I want my life to look like? I had to reinvent myself. Um, what were some of my priorities? What did I want my life to look like? What were my goals? I didn't really have, I mean, my goals revolved around surviving and keeping people safe and doing those things. But now what do I do? Um, I'll tell you another thing that happened is, um, I, like I said, I needed to reinvent myself without losing myself, if that makes any sense. So I had to reinvent myself. I had to take those parts of myself that were good, and I had to incorporate some new things in there to take the place of those darker places. Um, I had a lot of life left. Listen, I'm, I'm going to be 60 on Saturday, and I've been retired for 10 or 12 years now. So it's not like I had to work till I was, you know, 72 and then died at 75. I mean, I had, a, I had a lot to think about. I had a lot of things to do and to plan. I had to have a, a second life to plan, basically. So where would I fit in? My whole circle of friends changed. Um, whereas my best friends before was the local police chief and things like that. 
And these are people that I dearly loved and I have no, but I haven't talked to them in years because my entire circle of life changed when I went back to school, when I started a little business, I had to be around people that were doing the same things and on the same path as me in order to get where I needed to be. Um, it's, it's, this may sound a little silly to some people, some may get it, but I even changed my haircut. I wore a flat top for 30 years. And I had to change. Now it's not like I got a ponytail now, but I had to change my haircut because <laughs> I'm Dr. Bob. I had to stop being Captain Norman and become Dr. Bob. And that was just one of those little, seems like a little thing, but it was a big thing for me. Uh, my girlfriend in, in, in kind of hinted that it might be a good idea. And she was absolutely right. I did it for her, but it turned out to be one of those changes that you have to make in order to move on. Um, so you also asked me, Richard also asked me to talk about the journey back, uh, talk about like health and physical trials and things like that. And so this is, these are the notes that I wrote. First of all, taking charge of your health is absolutely imperative. You cannot be your best self or give to the people that mean the most to you if you're not at your best, emotionally and physically. It's, it's a constant struggle. You can't give the people that you love your best. Um, I deal with uh, dealing in, in, when I deal with the, the health and wellness side of things on this end, um, I have people that come to me all the time that don't have the energy to play with their kids or grandkids that are overweight or, you know, they've got arthritic pain or they have all these different things that are keeping them from being the person that they want to be with their loved ones. Um, you mentioned some of the things I love to do at the beginning. I'm going to be 60 years old Saturday and I still strength train and I skydive and I play golf a couple of days a week and I mountain bike. And I, I don't, I don't want to be that guy that sits around and does nothing because I don't feel good because I'm old or whatever the case might be. <laughs> so that physical part of it is, is they go hand in hand, physical and emotional strength go hand in hand fitness. Um, when I was, when my kids were little, I wanted to be my kid's hero. That was my goal. And now that they're adults, my goal became to be the kind of man that my grandsons want to be like. I have two grandsons. One's getting ready to start driving next month. So I want to be the kind of man that they want to emulate. And I took some of the positive stuff, the strength, the self-confidence, and carried it over. But then I tempered it with kindness and compassion and empathy. And I think that's what makes a well-rounded person. That's my, in my humble opinion. Um, my attitude when I was at the prison carried over to this day. But my attitude was always that you can't beat me. You're not going to beat me physically and you're not going to beat me mentally. I'm going to win. I don't care if I have to walk out of here carrying my leg over my shoulder, I'm going to win. And I think you have to have that kind of attitude when you're talking with someone like Richard, who's trying to help guide you on your journey. And it is a journey and it is a constant learning, growing process. You don't just talk to him one time and all of a sudden you're great. Just like you don't take a supplement for three days or you don't work out twice and you look like Schwarzenegger. It doesn't work that way. It's a constant process. Um, but, but I believe that that attitude is what helped me get through so well. And I said this in my notes that a lot of uh, my friends and family and stuff, they all call me Superman, but they never saw all the work and struggle and all the sacrifice and different things that went into being the guy that they say is Superman. They didn't see the self-doubt the um feeling like you weren't good enough that carried over from being a child um the perfectionism that is never attainable and will drive you crazy if you try to get it um in fact my biggest struggle in that area was forgiveness self-forgiveness forgiving myself for making mistakes and allowing myself to be human 
Um, and that's part of the shadow that Richard's talking about. That, you know, that's a that's kind of a dark side of our personalities where you just you strive to be just absolutely perfect. Because the reason I did it was because of my quote unquote conditioning from my dad and, and my my kid's mom, where I felt like I was always never I was never good enough. So I have to continue to get better, to get better, to get better for someone else. Once I realized I needed to do it for me, it was a totally different ball game. Um, one of the other things that helped me is that I learned gratitude through doing charity work. I started and ran a food bank for eight years, focusing on elderly shut-ins. I work with elderly people now, and I did some volunteer work at the animal shelter. And you have no idea how beautiful life is and how fortunate and blessed you are until you talk to someone that doesn't have enough to eat. And man, does it give you a different perspective on life. I got so much more out of that charitable work than the people I helped did. So much more. Um, and like I said before, just a minute ago, life is, the whole process is an absolute journey. Change is inevitable. It's going to happen. Growth is optional. So you get a choice when something changes, whether you become bitter or better. You get to be bitter and hang on to it. Just hang. I know people that have hung on to stuff for 40 years. <laughs> and I know other people that get through it and then they respond differently. You get to grow and become a better person. Every next level of your life is going to require a new and improved version of you. Because you've got to be, you've got to become the kind of person that attracts into your life the things that you want. You don't get to wish for them. You've got to work for it. And you've got to become the kind of person. You're not entitled to it. You're not entitled to anything. you got to work for it. You've got to develop yourself and become that person. Um, the other thing about that, relating to that, is that you cannot build a better life for yourself using the exact same thinking that got you where you are now. Because if you're talking to Richard, you're using him as a coach, and you're you're going through this program, you clearly have some things in life that you want to change or improve. <clears throat> and you can't use the same thinking that got you where you need to improve things to get you to where you where everything's better. It just doesn't work that way. So keep that in mind. For example, if you want respect, you have to be respectable. If you want love, you have to be loving. If you want kindness, you have to be kind. You because you get out of life what you put into it, period. Um, it's a constant, like I said, it's a constant, constant process. And I'll say this, I'm almost finished, but I'll say this. Richard hit on it, and man, I had this note written down, so I'm going to repeat what he had to say, but it is so much more difficult these days to be a man. You have, you got to discover who you are, what you like, what you dislike, what your needs and wants are, and why. And you throw into that the fact that we live in a time where garbage terms like toxic masculinity are thrown around like it's some kind of a virtue if you put a guy down that's masculine. And I'm sorry, masculinity is absolutely vital in this world today. Absolutely vital. You are not virtuous as jordan peter said peterson said if you're weak and kind because kindness is your only option if you're weak he is to be strong to be a monster but have it under control because then when you're kind it's because you choose to be and that's virtuous not being vir not being kind because you weak and it's the only option you have um there are even things like testosterone levels that are plummeting as a result of chemicals, as a result of foods, as a result of a lot of different things. Um, I was saying, getting into, because when, when you're talking, so you're talking about an environment in this world today where masculinity and, and men are under attack. I'm sorry, they are. Men are absolutely being attacked from every angle. Um, you're basically in some people's eyes the lowest form of whatever if you're a guy especially for god's sake if you're masculine male 
right? You're just like the worst of the worst. But those are the people you look to when there's a problem. Um, but that's one of the things that makes what Richard's doing and his workshops and his classes so crucial. If you want to take your life to that next level, if you want to live up to your potential, you've got to take care of your mental health your emotional health, and your physical health. The things that we repress, and you mentioned the, the shadow and the darkness of it, but I need people to understand as well that sometimes that shadow consists of positive things that we repress. So the example that I'll use, because you'll you push them down into that shadow, and the example that I'll use is Again, I'll just use the prison, for example. But if you ever if you ever noticed any any soldiers or military that came back from war, they've seen horrible violence and they had to become different people to survive in that environment. And it was the same thing at the prison. I became a very hard man, very hard, very rigid. And I had to because it helped me survive. But I saw. And you touched on this too. I saw so many, I probably lost five or six officers to suicide because they couldn't handle that stress. They didn't have control of it. I can't count. I would need a calculator to count how many guys I saw flush their lives down the toilet because they were running around with the other guys trying to fit in. They were crawling into a bottle, drinking. They were doing everything they could wrong you mentioned porn and alcohol and all these other things. They look to all these outside influences to try to take care of that stress, to try to suppress that monster, that shadow. And it never works. It never works. It works temporarily. You might feel pretty good when you're high or when you're looking at that girl or when you, you know, you're, you're drinking a few beers, feel good for a little while, but all that stuff's a depressant. Eventually it's going to come back to you. Um, so I mentioned like guys, I, I watched them go into the bottle. I watched them do all these different things, cheat on their wives because, well, buying the next biggest motorcycle or this, you know, $80,000 truck, or I can get this girl at the bar to sleep with me, even though my wife and kids are at home, that all makes you feel like a big man, right? Because, you know, it's, it's a temporary fix to the things that you're, like you mentioned earlier, the things that you're avoiding, the things that you're afraid to fix. So you've got to face those things. And I'll tell you in closing, a couple of things that I feel really helped me through because I didn't really always realize what I was doing, even though I was doing it when I was dealing with these shadow things and all that. Um, a couple of things helped me through this. And this is, again, why I recommend somebody like Richard, because I have, was fortunate enough to have a mom who thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread who made me feel like I was special and I could do anything. And I was fortunate enough that I believed her. Okay. I also had many, many, many real men as role models. My dad, my grandfathers, my uncles. Um, I was in the JCs at a very young age. In fact, I'll tell you real quick. I rem I'll never forget this. I had a very dear friend. We were kids since we were little, grew up a couple hundred yards from each other. And in our 20s, I had a discussion with him because I had to tell him that his wife was cheating on him. And I didn't know how to say it. So I wrote the guy's name on a piece of paper and handed it to him. And he opened it and he said, I kind of thought so. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Bob, he said, I wish I would have hung out with you more when we were teenagers. Maybe my life wouldn't be like this. So I had so many positive influences in Romo. And not everybody has that. I get that. But you got one right here in front of you that you can turn to to get you there now. It's never too late to start that journey. Um, Cause you gotta have a guide. You gotta have someone that's gonna hold you accountable. Someone that's going to help you get to a level that you won't get to by yourself. That you're going to maybe make an excuse why you didn't do this. But when you have somebody holding your feet to the fire, it is, it's an unbelievable advantage. Um, and I'm gonna say this in closing, believe it or not, I'm finished. <laughs> When you get control of your shadow, when you start to deal with these things, that doesn't guarantee you a stress, trouble-free life. You're still going to have crisis. 
You're still going to have loss. You're still going to have heartbreak. You're still going to have these things that happen in life. It's called life. What will change is how you respond to them and how well you come through them out the other side. And I'll say this in closing. Life is absolutely beautiful, guys, and it is amazing on this side. You need to come over on this side with us and stop wallowing and stop stop denying things and just face it head on. That's the only way to face a problem, head on. So, and that I'll close. i sorry if I ran a little bit long, but I get a little passionate about that topic. Uh, I hope that addressed the things that you wanted to talk about. Um, and I will tell you that any of your guys on here that um, do need some help in, on the physical side, the wellness and health side, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put a link uh, in, uh, we can put a link in the, in the recording or something for, um, I have a website for the CBD. Um, I also have a complete dispensary for supplements that I, I've developed protocols for different wellness and health issues. And you can reach out to me. And I can get you into my system so that you can go in and look around and, and you can ask questions and you can look at some of the protocols and see if there are some things that you can maybe do to help you on the wellness side as you're dealing with these other things with Richard on the emotional side. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely get that up in there for them <clears throat> so that they have it and have access to all your stuff. That was okay. fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. And I think a big piece of what's there also is, and I want to thank you for this, was being vulnerable to share that story. That's a big piece that most men kind of shove down, especially into the shadow side, because we've been stomped on so many times. Everybody mm -hmm. has. That we shove it down and we put a wall up in front and everybody's kept out there. Nobody gets to see the real us when it matters. And that's one of the most beautiful things about this transition and this growth. Um, I'll tell you a quick funny story. My girlfriend bought me this just absolutely beautiful Valentine's card. And I'm, I mean, I'm crazy about the girl to begin with. But she bought me this beautiful, touching Valentine's card. And I stood there and cried when I read it. And we always joke. Um, I'll never forget one time I was doing some construction work, work around my house. And I found this little kitten. And somebody looked at me, I'm holding this kitten in one hand and I got a hammer in the other. And they said, this is crazy. I'm looking at this big, strong man, <laughs> hammer in one hand and a little kitten in the other hand. And we joke about our little dog because we have a little Boston Terrier is one of our dogs. And I carry her around and I kiss her on the neck and she puts her head up. And I really don't care what anybody thinks about it because that's who I am. If I love you, I love you with everything I got. But I just avoid, the, I just, I don't waste my time. And that's one of the beautiful things about this growth, this journey, is that you'll get to the point where you put your needs and you put your family and you put things that are important in your life first above all of that approval, needing needing approval, all of those external forces that you're looking to. Yep. Yeah, it's as men, we get need to get back to being selfish for our needs. Mm hmm. We give to everybody. That's, that's how we're really trained. And I mean, it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I love that I provide for my family. Absolutely. That I ran my butt off for my kids through their sports and sacrificed everything that I had to give them that stuff. I love it. That, that's who I am. And that's how I was. That, that was what I modeled. And now I get to bring it back and show them it's my time. Yeah. I need to take care of me fix my stuff on the inside so I can be even better. Like you said, you want to be that model for your grandkids, that, that hero for them now. Mm -hmm. And I was very similar. You know, mine was, I always wanted my kids to be better than me because I knew I was broken and I wanted them to be better. And this is how I help them be better than me being able to function whole and that's why these two wolves are up here because I have the white and the dark and it's mm -hmm. not about them being separate. I'm hooking them up on the front of my dog sled now and we're going and I'm feeding both of these guys and changing the world. And so that's what's, how what's you take care of About the wolves. You have a good wolf and a bad wolf and the kid says, which one wins is the one you feed the most. That's, okay. that's the, 
distorted version of the story. <laughs> because <laughs> if you're only feeding one, the one's back there slurking around, waiting oh, yeah. to jump on you when you're down. You just have to feed that ghoul a little bit more. <laughs> just be good. Um, no, I totally, totally, totally agree with you. 100%. It's it's absolutely right. And I, I've i gotten to the point where I, I mean, I take, I get massage, I get acupuncture. Um, I, like I said, I earlier today, I was like, you know what? I need a break from preparing these notes. I went up and hit the weight room. I have a weight room in my house. Um, take care of yourself. You know, do for you as well. That That's something that you 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 go through life thinking it's bad to do and it's not. No, and that's the word selfish has been corrupted in our language to mean that it's a bad thing. Yeah, it's actually being putting yourself first. And you've been there as the leaders and stuff. You get on an airplane. What's one of the first things they tell you when the mask drops down? You put yours on first so you can help everybody else, because yeah, if you can't breathe, you're just another problem for everybody else to try and work on. Yep. So you got to do you first. Absolutely right. So thank you again. That was fantastic. So I'm going to jump back into the presentation here and share a few more pieces with everybody. That comes up. There we go. There we go. Perfect. We're going to talk about five benefits of doing this shadow work. And it's nice that you know Dr. Bob shared as much as he did, because a lot of these are going to piggyback right on to the message that he shared. One of the biggest benefits is that you're going to improve your relationships because you're going to be a better person. You're going to have control of your emotions because you're going to have emotional intelligence and be able to respond effectively, not just blindly reacting to all the stimulus that you get hit with on an everyday basis. You're going to have a better relationship with yourself, even more important than with anybody else. You're going to know what makes you work, and you're going to have that purpose and drive back in your life that's missing for so many of us. You're going to have a clearer perception. All that smoke that's in the background, it's hiding everything. It's distorting the mirrors. The masks that we have on, they're going to get shed, and you're going to get to see what's really in front of you. And you're going to have a clear picture of yourself when you look in the mirror for the first time. And that's huge because most of us don't like the person that we are in the mirror. You're going to have more energy and physical health. Again, like Dr. Bob mentioned, you, know, you work out, you take care of the whole body. You're not just taking care of one part. And you have the physical body. You have your emotional body. You have your mental body and your spiritual body. All of this works together to make you a rounded person. And when everything is taken care of, all the physical ailments that we experience will go away. Because when we harvest harvest, not the right word, but hoard that anger and rage inside us, it turns into heart problems. When you can't speak the truth, you end up with stomach problems. They're all related to the emotions that we are bottling up and not dealing with. And that's where we need to have more of that vulnerability in our lives. You're going to have the psychological integration. Those little small children that we have inside our head, those voices. And when you sit down and put them around the table, you're going to bring them back in so you can have that balanced psyche. And once you get to that point, that's really special. When you can sit there and take the moment, say the voice starts, hey, okay, I hear you. What do you need me to do? How do you need me to help you today? All of a sudden, you're back in control and you're driving the car instead of just being a passenger going wherever it's going to go. That's just a train wreck waiting to happen. And lastly, it's going to lead to more creativity in your life. Because 
you're going to have more time to express it. You're going to have the opportunity to go into your mind and it actually be still and quiet. And for those of us that have really struggled with the shadow, you know exactly what I'm saying. The mind never shuts off. It's going 24-7. And once you get that there and you create space by learning how to do breathing techniques, how to meditate, how to sit with yourself and be alone with yourself, you become a very powerful person. So five ways that we're going to do this. The first one is learning how to center yourself. And, you know, we've all probably heard a lot about breathing techniques over the years. A simple one is the 4444, the box breathing. They talk about it a lot in the service, people that do sports. It's a great way to get control of the systems inside your body your adrenaline system, your endocrine system, controlling it and getting it where instead of it's just going everywhere, responding out of control to everything, you're taking that control by putting it in line. So you breathe in for four. You hold for four. You breathe out for four. And you hold for four while you're empty. And you repeat that starting out at least three times, but moving up to it around 10 so that you're creating this space where you're just focusing on your breathing. And you'll notice that the more you do it, the more you slow down. Another great way to center yourself is to take your fingertips and rub them together so lightly and focus on the feeling of the ridges from your fingerprints. So you can feel all the contours there and do that for about five seconds without thinking of anything else. If something comes up, the thought pops, just tie it to a balloon and watch it float away. Take your hand and rub it down the other hand, feeling the ridges, the creases, calluses on your hands, feeling all the different parts so that you get are focused on the sensation. That allows you to center yourself and be focused on exactly where you want your mind. We're going to cultivate self-compassion, learning how to forgive yourself, finding gratitude and happiness in the things you do right now. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase from uh, Kung Fu Panda. You know, when Master Ugwe is talking to Po up by the peach tree. He says noodles, not noodles, present, past, fight, don't fight. It doesn't matter. You're so worried about everything that's happened in the past, who you were yesterday, all the fears and anger and rage that we have there. And you're so worried about what may happen out in the future and all the anxiety and tension that that creates that you're not present in this moment, enjoying the peaches that you're actually eating. The present's a gift in and of itself when we take the time to be present there and enjoy it. And that's where that self-compassion comes in. Hey, a mistake happened. Yeah, I had a thought. I looked at a girl my wife smacked me for. Okay, <laughs> it happens. I'm not going to beat myself up over it because I'm not perfect. I'm never going to claim to be. I've learned to let that side go. And it, it was a failure. I learned from it. It was my first, not maybe not my first attempt in learning, but it was a attempt in learning. I'm failing my way forward every day. I'm picking myself up when I get knocked down and I'm stepping forward again. We're going to cultivate self-awareness. So that as soon as you hear that voice start, you address it. It creates a self-reflective mindset, which is the ability to observe your behaviors, your thoughts, and your feelings so that you can respond 
the way you want to be. That response is critical. When we respond, we're powerful. When we react, we're just another animal out there in the world. And it really is that black and white. You're going to learn to be courageously honest, to be raw, to be relevant, and to be real with yourself, with the people in your world, so that everybody respects you. They may not like what you say, and that's perfectly fine. But you're not going to hide behind the lies and the masks anymore. You're going to be the person that you're designed to be. And you're going to learn to journal, to record everything. Sit here and have a conversation with yourself and write it out in a journal. Mine, tablets. I've got three or four journals here on my desk that I use all the time. I keep track of everything because I learn something new almost every day. When I take the time to just listen to myself, it's a great conversation. And we're going to do this, those five things, by working through these five exercises that I'm going to share with you tonight. These are all can be done on your own as you start this journey. The first one is to watch your emotional reactions. How many times have you been there and you're driving a car and somebody's tailgating you? You get cut off in traffic. Somebody flips you the bird because they're having a bad day. How are you responding? You know, are you constantly on edge where you're leaning forward, you're gripping the steering wheel tightly? That's your emotional response. If somebody's riding your tailgate, you feel your heart start pounding and you start, you know, it starts thumping hard and your ears start burning because your blood pressure's up. Is it worth staying that keyed up or can you slide over and let them go on by and, you know, move back over to pass the next car when a window opens up? And as a person that's an aggressive driver, I, I, I get where you're at with that because I like to drive fast. So I understand that. But it's about paying attention and catching these faster, recognizing them when they happen instead of letting them build and build and build, putting them aside and not paying attention to them. those emotions. It's energy for you to put into motion to do something with. Once you put it into motion, you get the learning from it, the experience. That's how you build that response. You have to work through it and not just let it happen. It's taking control and guiding that train where you want it to go. And the more attention that you focus on this, the more you put into it, the more you train yourself to notice all the little reactions. And that gets you closer to being in control, having that emotional intelligence to really live the life you want to live. The second one, and this is, a lot of us do this on a regular basis anyways, but it's to engage in an inner dialogue. And this isn't just letting the dialogue run, it's actively having a conversation with yourself. And yeah, I, I get it. I know the stigma out there, oh man, you're talking to yourself, you must be a looney tune. I talk to myself all day long. Now granted, I'm usually at home alone here in my office, but I talk to myself. I wake up in the morning, hey, what do we need to focus on today? And I listen for the answer. My intuition is working better. I'm listening, I'm paying attention to all the pieces of me because I don't care what anybody else thinks anymore. I do to some level, but I'm work that's one of my biggest parts. These aren't different personalities. You're not crazy for talking to yourself and listening to the voices in your head. They're there. Every person I talk to, every person I work with, athlete, person, anything, 
they all talk to themselves. I know I do, and I know you do too, whether you want to admit it or not, it's happening. So why not engage it on a level that actually helps you do something and take charge of the situation instead of letting it just run? It's not an accident that it's happening. When you sit there and you stare that demon in the eye, that shadow, and you're brave enough and courageous enough to say, what's up, man? What do you need today? All of a sudden, the table turns. And he looks at you like for a second. And he's like, oh, you're going to pay attention today. I got gotcha. you. Well, here's what we need. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, good. Then keep track of it. Journal it. Write it down. Make them your allies instead of being your enemies. They're going to be there anyways. Do you want to fight them every day? Or do you want to help them or have them help you get what you want? This one's a little bit on the other side of that. Because at the same time, we're focusing on the shadow side here. You got to look at the part of you that's the good guy. Especially for guys, we've all probably had the nice guy syndrome. You got to be the nice guy. Well, I'm saying fuck the nice guy. Dr. Bob said it very concisely. Be kind. Be compassionate. Fuck being a nice, insecure, neurotic person that society says you got to be. Because there's no place for that nice guy in this world. You can be kind. You can be compassionate. You can have all of that. But be balanced with every part of you. That's what we're striving for. That's how you highlight the opposites and bring both pieces together to have balance. You can't have the mean guy with the nice guy because they're going to fight. But if you have the mean guy and the kind guy and they sit there and can sit at the table and pass the knife back and forth to each other to cut their steak. Now you're having a conversation that's going somewhere. Now you're accomplishing something. And this challenges you to be disciplined. Such an important role. And it's all about accepting all parts of you. Just because society says that that part's good doesn't mean that part's good for us. And we need to evaluate that. Number four, get to know your shadow archetypes. This is a little bit further down the line. This isn't something you're going to jump right into. Our archetypes are part of our psychological profile. They're with us all the time. There's four masculine archetypes that are the primary ones the king the warrior the magician the lover and depending on who you go to there's up to 164 down to 30 something it depends just like everything out there in the world but learning which ones work for you and how you respond in situations helps drive the behaviors and these are all about the behaviors that we bring. And like we've been talking here with the duality piece, these archetypes have that duality. You can be the king, but you can also be the destructive, whiny part. You have on the shadow side, you even have two on the shadow side. You have the active side and the passive side. And this shows up a lot. You know, the, you can have the benevolent king or you can have the tyrant or you can have the weakling tyrant that is the whiny crybaby. And I'm not labeling, I'm just making the point. You can have the warrior or you can be the sadist and misogynistic. It's all about the behaviors and working within these. They're on a spectrum, and you're constantly going back and forth in this. You're never just 
exactly one. And kind of the thing is, guys, the benevolent king never got to be the benevolent king unless he was kind of the sadistic warrior and a tyrant that knocked out all the pieces to create the peace within the kingdom. The kingdoms ourselves. So it all starts with us. And don't get hung up on the labels that everything is. Just look at the behaviors, the patterns, so that you can identify your thoughts and build that reaction. That's what it's all about. And you know, if you want to learn more about these archetypes, The King, The Warrior, The Magician, and The Lover by Moore and Gillette, you can find it on Amazon. The last one. Is actually called the three, two, one shadow process. This is the process of actually working with your shadow and building the integrity within yourself to move. So step one. Choose what you want to work with. Choose the person, the part of you. That's having the difficulty. Are you having a problem with your partner? Is it a relative, parent, you know, a sibling, cousin? Is it your boss at work? Find out what it is that's causing you. Are they irritating you? What are they doing? What actions are they taking? What is it about them that has you? having a problem with them. And then you want to choose someone with whom you have a strong emotional charge with, either positive or negative, so that you can see the duality that's going on here within this. Then you're going to face it. You're going to imagine this person. You're going to describe the qualities that most upset you. Or, on the other side, the characteristics that attracted you to them. We want you to get a perceptual position. You know, like an eagle of wisdom looking down on them saying, hey, look at this stuff. This is the things I have a problem with. An unemotional response to what's really causing you to have problems. And I want you to talk out loud or write it down in a journal, expressing exactly what those feelings are and why you're being, having the reaction that you are. Don't calculate saying the right things. Don't worry about being nice. Don't worry about being polite. Cuss them out. Get it out. Get all the rage and the anger, all the stuff inside you. Get it out. It has to move out of your body. And that's what we're talking about here, which leads to step three, talking. Now you want to have a conversation with this person in your head. Scream at them, yell at them, cuss at them. Nobody else is going to hear you. Well, I mean, your neighbors may if you're that loud, but, you know, I'm just kidding. But it's, you know, let it out. Again, physically giving it voice and giving it power to get it out of you. Talk directly at them sitting in a chair. Tell them specifically what it is that bugs you and ask them questions. Why are you doing this to me? What do you want from me? What are you trying to show to me? What do you have to teach me? And imagine what their response is going to be. Speak that response out loud. Hear yourself saying it and record this conversation in your journal. So that you're seeing the dialogue going back and forth. You're creating this all in your head. Then you want to become this person. Take on their qualities that you're having a problem with. Whether they're annoying you or fascinating you. Embody the traits that you just described in step two. Say, I am this. I am that. It's going to feel awkward. And it should. Because these traits are the exact ones that you're denying 
that exist in you. And that's why you're having the reaction you're having to them. I am angry. I am jealous. I am radiant. I am the light. Whatever it may be. Get it out of you. Say what it is. So you hear yourself saying it. So you're giving it voice. Recognizing it on a deeper level. So that you notice what these qualities are. And you see that they're stuck over there in the corner. Shoved aside because there's something that you got told you shouldn't be like that. You want this to be real. To be visceral with this. So that it is a full-blown process. If you're not being real with it, you're still just letting it sit over there on its own. And that's not what we want. We want you to dive right into this. To be a part of this brotherhood that fights for what they want. But it starts with building you first. That's what this primal brotherhood that I'm building is all about. And because I want to make such an impact with this and help so many people with their shadow, I'm offering this through this weekend only. This is an intensive three-session experience where we're going to dive deep into your shadow, where you're going to have conversations with your shadow. You're going to sit there and go out in the water. And you're going to integrate that power, the courage, the resiliency, the integrity of all of these parts coming back together so that we can pull them out of the shadows. And we're going to bring forth the light and the dark forces within you so that you can experience the complete range of emotions that are part of this human experience. It's going to include journaling exercises. You're going to have prompts to go from. Guided meditations. Guided visualizations. And we're going to recognize. How to have these conversations. So that you can learn how to do it on your own. And we're going to be with you there every step of the way. We're going to keep you tethered for a few times. Because. It is a challenge from time to time to go into that darkness and come back out. For this experience, through this weekend only, it's going to be $250. And trust me when I say that that is a fantastic price. <laughs> After that, it's going to jump up for $750. And I'm going to kick this off on March 1st will be the first session. So with that in mind... I'd like to just take you guys on a journey just so you can actually sit across the fire from your shadow. And we're going to do it a little bit differently than probably anything else you've ever experienced. So give everybody a second just to stretch because I know it's been a little bit of a long time tonight. We're going on just over an hour and a half and it's been a fantastic conversation. Uh, everybody's getting a lot out of it. So, kick back, get nice and comfy, close your eyes, and take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Keep breathing, and what I want you to do is draw your finger down your forehead. Right in the middle of your forehead. And as you get down to your eyebrows, you're going to feel there's a slight ridge there on your forehead. And with this next breath in, as you breathe out, I want you to push that spot right there. And notice that your mind goes completely blank. Just like pushing a button. And let off. And notice that you're just sitting like in a white room all by yourself. And your mind is calm. 
and quiet. So from here, we're going to take a little journey. And I want you just to keep focusing on breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Let any thoughts that come just see like a revolving door out there in front of you where just breathe it in and let it go back out the door. And I want you to see that there's a stairway in front of you now. It leads down. It spirals around. We're just going to go start walking down the stairs. Feeling the darkness, coolness, as we descend down into the basement, going deeper and deeper, walking down the stairs. You end up in this big room again. It's kind of down in the basement. Might be kind of man cave or whatever it may look like. There's a big fire pit in the middle of the room. Got a stone floor, got decorations on the walls. You got different chairs seated around this fire pit. There's a nice fire in there. It's not too big, it's not too small. The room's nice and warm and comfy. It's a little dark around the edges. You walk up and you sit down at the fire. Reach your hands out and warm them. You feel yourself getting comfortable, relaxing. Still just focusing on breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth. And the room's awful quiet, so you start looking around. You see, like, decorations on the walls. It might be, like, some trophies, or some battle gear, some guns or spears, swords, axes, shields. Maybe some antlers or some animal trophies. It's true rustic experience almost like a medieval kingdom type feel to it and as you look back down as your gaze comes back down to the fire you notice that there's two wolves sitting across the fire from you you feel that little tingle of excitement What's this mean? So the black wolf holds up his paw, letting you know that he's going to talk just telepathically to you. So you hear his voice in your head as he introduces himself to you, that he's the representation of your shadow. For this meeting. And as part of this story of the two wolves, you hear him say that it's not just about feeding the good wolf over the bad wolf. It's not just about seeing the anger and the despair and hearing the howling with the darkness or just seeing the happiness, the benevolence with the white wolf. Life is all about happiness and sadness, benevolence and brutality. As humans, as people, we weave a complex story of love and hate, serenity and loss. 
and that these forces are always opposing each other inside of us. One is never completely in control. They're always there, like yin and yang, within us. And our job is not to be one or the other. It's to hold the line between the two. It's that duality. Never discarding or hiding any part of us, but taking into account the whole. Making us visible. And controlling it in order to live in balance, to be neutral. The wolf goes on to say, That the darkness brings the determination, tenacity, courage, strategic thinking, that hardness, that brutality you need to have. That the white wolf lacks. And the white wolf has the good sides. The positive, the love, the kindness, the compassion that the dark wolf does not. So you need both to be the best that you can be. And this enhances your version, the vision you have of these two sides. It lets you identify their needs and trains them to be in harmony always leading you forward. And he leaves you with, let's not starve our fears. Let's recognize them, understand them, and transform them into the energy they are. Let's not starve our anger, our spite, or our sadness. Let's not put them in a corner and berate them. But may we hear what they have and want to tell us. They can give us many valuable lessons on how to be a little bit better each day. And he puts his paw down and he lets you just think about that. And the white wolf just sits there quietly, letting you have this conversation. And when you look back up at the dark wolf, you see his eyes glowing red. You see those strengths within him. And as you take a deep breath, the wolves walk away. You thank them as they leave, and you turn and walk back up the stairs, coming back up into your being, back up into your room, into the calm, quiet space. And now you feel lighter. You're no longer conflicted within yourself. The fear does not exist for the shadow. It is merely a part of you. And that changes the game. But with a deep breath in, Breathing out, just letting everything, all the tension that's left, leave your body. Taking one more deep breath in. Wiggling your toes, your fingers, coming back into your body until you're wide awake, fully back in the room. Great job.